just thought I might introduce myself for a change. I usually never do that. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce also my new course on Plato's Politeia, the Republic, which um, I just completed the recording of. I went to Athens. I'll show you some of the videos here today. Um, I went to Athens for the first time in uh, the spirit of anamnesis and the, the genius Loki, the local spirit, uh, took hold of me. It's, at least in some areas, I had a view of the of the Acropolis, and uh, also I also went to Delphi. So I recorded video lectures in and around um, Athens and Delphi, uh, outside, just in front of the Temple of Apollo but also with a view of the Parthenon. And so today I'll just uh, introduce the course and what it is that we'll be reading together. So if you've been meaning to read Plato's Republic for some time, then this perhaps is just the ticket for you. Uh, we'll begin on the 20th of January, which is a Saturday, if you want to join in with the live Zoom seminars. We'll be reading all 10 books, not all of the, uh, not everything, but the most important parts, obviously. And, but we will not, and we will read Plato and understand Plato not as a Platonist. That's what's crucial. If you understand that Plato is not a Platonist and um, that Platonism is derivative, and especially Neoplatonism, so what Plotinus does to Platonism is ex extremely derivative uh, to Plato and what Plato was after. And that Plato actually, as a matter of fact, um, already uh, over uh, sort of predicts and overcomes uh, the Universal's controversy, the Universalienstreit in German. Then I think this course is for you. We'll be focusing on a few things. Let me just show you perhaps briefly. This is the edition that I will be uh, using. So this is... Um, the original Greek text with the translation by Friedrich Schleiermacher, which is the standard classical German translation of the 19th century. Uh, I have tried to provide some of my own uh, translations or attempts at translations of some of the terms. For example, eidos will be thinking of for the most part as concept, as begriff, um, will be und will understand why translating dikaiosyne as justice will probably for the most part, especially in the beginning, lead only to confusion. So what I propose is that we translate dikaiosune as that which is appropriate and that this is repeated on all the different levels, the levels of the soul, the level of the, of the three different castes, if you like, and ultimately also in um, the sphere or the realm of the forms. So, as Plato is not a Platonist, Plato does not uh, believe in some sort of ghost-like um, hinterworld uh, where forms eternally reside. Uh, there's quite something else going on. We'll get to this at the course. Let me perhaps show you now. If you have any questions, by the way, uh, on this course specifically, let me know. I'll get to them in the end. I'll be live for about half an hour. Let me also point out that we have, um, so you have to click around a bit, I apologize for that, that we have about uh, 20 or a bit less um, places left in the seminars actually at this point already. So if you're keen on reading this book next year, perhaps now is the time to enroll. We'll begin on the 20th of January, which is a Saturday. We always meet from 6 to 8 p.m. And we are going into our fifth year at Halkion. And... So I founded Halkion in 2020, in March, and ever since then we've grown to a faculty of five. That's uh, Sebastian Ostrich and uh, Thomas Chokin, Sean McFadden and uh, Ryan Hacker and uh, yours truly, that would be me. Uh, we have been uh, teaching uh, for the past, well, most of them have joined me actually last year or this year. And so next year we'll be offering courses on, well, Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which I also recorded in 
Athens and in Delphi. And actually, some of the lectures I recorded in Aristotle's Lyceum. So in the spirit of Peripatos, I took a walk around. It's a bit of a bizarre thing to do, perhaps, but why not, you know? Uh, and um, and I, uh, I will also teach a course on Kant next year, a long course on Immanuel Kant. We'll have a course on the philosophy of power taught by Sean Mac. Uh, Fadden will have a course on Augustine, taught by Sebastian Ostrich. He might also teach Hegel. I have to convince him still. We'll find out. And we have another course on Plato, on beauty and virtue, taught by Thomas Jockin. So that one we're looking forward to, uh, especially that one. It is uh, has been in the making for a couple of years now, and finally we can offer the course. So let me show you what it looks like on the inside. That's the wrong one. So <laughs> so here you can see me um, the quality should be should improve when we click on 540. So um, th these are some of, this is what I recorded up in, down in uh, Athens, I mean, with a view of the Acropolis. Um, so we'll have 10 video lectures and I might also just mention now what it is that um, uh, we'll be learning at the course. We will obviously begin where the book itself begins with a question for what is quote unquote just or rather let's say appropriate. We will also understand that the polis which um, which Plato describes is the place where as I pointed out in the first lecture is the place where the nomos or the law of the cosmos is translated into the law of the human sphere. So um, and I, well, here's a funny question. What did you study and where did you study? Well, if you must know, I studied philosophy, politics and economics in Italy and in America. I did a master's in philosophy with a focus on Kant at King's College London. And I have a PhD in philosophy, which focuses mainly on, but the work of the thesis at least focused mainly on Heidegger. But uh, obviously there's also some Hegel and some Kant and Fichte and Plato and Aristotle in there. Uh, at school, um, where, when I went to the Humanistische Gymnasium by St. Stefan in Germany, I read Plato and Aristotle and the so-called pre-Socratics in the original Greek. So it's not a requirement that you know ancient Greek uh, but you will walk away from the course uh, having a bit of a better, better perhaps feel for the language, uh, and also you, you know, will try when, when the translation gets really obscure, um, then we'll just focus on the Greek text. So uh, let's go on. So we will consider how the city emerges from the initial discussion at the Piraeus Harbour on uh, on the question of what is appropriate, what is appropriate for man, what is appropriate for the polis, uh, who is the appropriate leader. This leads on to the question of the guardians of the polis. Plato just about now does not yet introduce the so-called philosopher kings that comes a bit later, we'll be looking at the guardian class uh, as well. Uh, we'll be looking at the theory of the soul, obviously. Uh, we have a brief lecture on um, on dialectics and diaresis, uh, which should be, I think, quite helpful. So what we'll do overall, maybe just point this out. Um, uh, is we're not so we'll, we will consider some of the quote-unquote political aspects of the politeia. But more importantly, 
we're looking at this as the foundational work of so-called Western metaphysics and ontology, and we'll understand the work as outlining this in, in, the, in the ethical dimension. Hence, the first word of the book is kateben, I walked down. So kata basis and ana basis will be crucial terms that we'll get that we'll return to again and again. But we'll also go beyond just the reading of Plato as a sort of a classical foundation. We will look at Plato as a myth maker. When we consider the myth or the vision of Ur in Book 10, but also, of course, the myth of the cave. And when we discuss the cave, we will consider question or, or phenomena of the metaverse, the internet, uh, mass media, etc. Also, the fact that Plato says that the philosopher ultimately has to rule through his superior understanding of and grasp of shadows. So, uh, let me continue. The analogies of the sun and the line we'll be discussing, that's um, in book six, uh, we'll be then moving, so the analogies of the sun and especially the, the analogy of the line is crucial because here we learn that so-called doxa, which can mean opinion, but for Plato can also mean illusion, uh, is, however, still pivotal on the path to the highest way of knowing, which is, of course, philosophical knowing. Okay, here's a good question. We'll get to that one later. Uh, and I won't respond to all of it now, but... Um, we'll then consider, maybe I'll show you a bit more. Let me see, theory of the soul. Yeah, here we are. So here's the lecture on the theory of the soul. Um, this was in Delphi, where I spent, I don't know, five or six hours just sitting by the column with the um, Temple of Apollo up there behind me. There, there it is. That's the Temple of Apollo. So I recorded, I think, two lectures there. One on the theory of the soul and the final lecture as well on the vision or the myth of Ur, which is the 10th book, which was uh, hugely influential on Christianity. But also, we must, we will read um, in a rather strict philosophical sense as where um, as a necessary moment uh, of the self-grounding of thinking but we'll get to this so this is in Delphi oh yeah maybe this is uh, this is close enough let me show you this one here this is close to this is around uh, also the Acropolis um, about maybe 15 minutes from the supposed, the alleged prison of uh, Socrates. Okay. All right, so that's inside the course. By the way, if you want to enroll, this is the link to do so. As I said, we have about 20 places left in the seminars. If, if they're filled up, then that's it. That's full and it will be, I don't know how many years until I'll be able to teach the course again. So, the myth of the cave. Uh, we'll be focusing on this from the... I think there is an exit from the cave and it has to do with logic. It has to do with losing our optic orientation. So we'll discuss a potential uh, leaving of the cave through, uh, well, proper metaphysics. Um, Hegel's science of logic is such an attempt. Uh, it is the uh, sort of the, the shortcoming of someone like Heidegger to have assumed that there is no exit from the cave because he remains, if you read his On the Essence of Truth, uh, he remains stuck on the on the optics um, of the of the cave. So he, he has quite a pictorial uh, thinking, 
uh, and uh, as Heidegger also disregards what's already already lurking or spitting, as it were, in Plato and in Aristotle, which is the, the free self-grounding of thinking, which is ultimately fully um, ex explicated by Kant and Hegel and Fichte, um, that it, because that's lacking in Heidegger, he doesn't see this, he can also not see the exit from um, the cave, which Plato presents us with. But we'll also look at the cave, obviously, as a myth that made, in part, the modern world. We can discuss uh, the Matrix films, for example, um, even though, of course, they completely misunderstand Baudrillard and, uh, and Plato. But that's fine. We'll then continue after the myth of the cave, which builds on the analogies of the sun and of the line. We uh, will turn to Periagoge and Paideia. So how it is that the philosopher gets turned and how it is that the philosopher gets, um, well, what sort of Paideia uh, we need to have um, in, uh, in order for the, for the philosopher to become a philosopher genuinely and truly. So Paideia will be a focus, Periagoga as well. Uh, and that's the seventh lecture. By the way, so there's no confusion, there are 10 lectures and there are 10 seminars, but at the final seminars, we'll combine two lectures. We'll probably combine uh, dialectics and the theory of the soul. Um, and at the final seminar, if you join in with the seminars, you can present your own talk. We'll, this time we'll do a, sort of a, a proper conference, which gives you more time. So we'll spend three hours or so a bit longer together. So you have more time to present your work. And that could be just a standard paper or talk or something very experimental as well. We'll then, of course, have to consider the dialectics of justice. So what is it um, that as we've gone through justice, quote unquote, dikaiosune, we must also consider its opposite. Uh, by the way, book seven ends on the so book seven. It's a book where the cave is discussed. Uh, it, book seven, or at least, it not, doesn't, you know, ends on the, the, a warning against dialectics, that it is at once necessary to get behind the hypothesis that is posited in thinking, but also is a dangerous play because it can lead to a conflation of being and non-being. Regardless of that, once we've stepped out of the cave and we've learned how the philosopher is um, turned and also then formed, we um, turn to the question of what are the unjust forms of, uh, of government. And what's crucial here is that Plato other than what perhaps some um, Platonists perhaps would like to have, Plato here becomes a historical thinker. He speaks of an, uh, an, 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 an anacyclosis of the different forms of government and how they cyclically repeat. So we'll be discussing that those... That, so this is when the, the, the course and the seminars and really turn a political... And um, we turn to more of the questions um, uh, political of um, of a nature of a, of a political nature, uh, and um, what Plato thinks of democracy uh, and, and such uh, things. And then Book Ten um, will actually because Book Ten is so rich, it's on mimesis and banning the banning of the poets. Obviously, I didn't mention this before. I apologize. We will discuss uh, the noble lie. We will discuss the idea of the good in the in the cave. The sun is the idea of the good. How beauty allows us to see the good, the true, and um, we will, of course, also uh, discuss in great detail the theory of the soul and how that uh, relates to the three castes of the polis. How it is that the polis arises philosophically to our intellectual intuition and is precisely not a blueprint as um, as Popper's quote-unquote open society. Uh, I will do at some point uh, a, either a live stream or a full video 
uh, on on Pop, I don't want to devote too much time to him. Uh, it's not really worth anyone's time, but it is important to understand that Popper is quite um, uh, is, is quite a deceiving, it's quite a deceptive text. The title is very deceptive. Right? The open society triggers within the liberal subject associations of uh, personal liberation and etc. etc. But the abstract society is ultimately a hardcore technocratic um, rule of abstracted subjects that have absolutely no grounding whatsoever in any rootedness and any place uh, and don't even need to have any contact with one another to quote uh, from Popper himself. So the book should have been called The Abstract Society and Its Enemies and the enemies are any society, any state, any community that is actually grounded in history and in uh, in something, or let's just say, in, in, in the organic. Um, Popper is worse than Russell. Well, you know, In Praise of Idleness by Russell gives you an idea uh, what Russell was on about. Uh, another, you know, fascinating title, which you could, you could think, oh, look, look at him. He does understand the importance of scolaire, of so-called leisure, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's also just a ruse. So, um, we will spend significant time on book 10, on uh, Mimesis and banning the poets, why it is that Plato wants to ban the poets, and also then consider the vision of Ur in uh, an extra seminar. Uh, so I, I found that um, really a striking... Um, I read the the text again of the vision of Ur in in um, in Delphi, and that's the one lecture I don't have a written lecture yet. At least I might just give you my handwritten notes as a um, scan, and maybe it, I don't know. Maybe it was again the 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 the, the, the vicinity to the to the temples, etc., that um, because you, one, one could simply disregard it as a weird allegory or something, but um, it's a way in which he, he tries to describe in it, I think, the necessity for thinking to uh, ground itself. Um, and so we'll get to, to that uh, in more detail in the course I... Uh, or maybe I could read this here. This is this is public anyways. So uh, this is at the Piraeus. So I went to Athens for the first time after I don't know twenty five years of reading these texts in the Greek. I went there for the first time this year, and it was a bit like coming home to to a degree. Um, <laughs> it was quite uh, a bit of work to find this pr the, the place I was at. Uh, I did I didn't have a team, so all I all I had was my phone. Uh, I, I you know I so I had to make sure that there's no back not at least not too much background noise, um, and so I did all the editing and everything all during that time. In Athens, I had about uh, five, four and a half days in Athens, and another two days in, one and a half days in Delphi. So, uh, with um, yeah, as I said, no team. If you look at what what other people are doing, and um, at least if, if even just for one podcast, they use three or four cameras at this point. Uh, so we're not we're quite far from that still, but I do want to get to a place where. I can do this on the level of Herbert von uh, Karajan and his uh, productions of uh, his video productions um, and audio productions. But that's uh, further down the line. So let me perhaps now I'll get to your questions. OK, so Susan is enrolled. Uh, maybe I'll get to some of the questions now. 
one second. Do you think the ele so it's not an allegory? Um, it's uh, it, it's maybe an analogy. Most likely, it's a myth. <clears throat> Is the first thought of the simulation matrix theory? No, precisely not. It's exactly the opposite. Um, and uh, it uh, there are these. I mean, if you read the Timaeus, uh, then but again, you know, Plato is not a Pythagorean. Uh, then one could draw that out from Pythagoreanism. That so there are these. There are so. Let's just say the. That thought or that uh, idea, that notion is definitely uh, brought into play. Um, but Plato is precisely at pains of trying to get to not reality, which is a framework, but actuality, as we would say, to that which is acting itself out to get to the things themselves. So if you want to prepare, by the way, for, um, for this course, but not just reading by Plato, but you you should read Heraclitus and Parmenides and try and figure out how it, what it is that Plato is trying to do as he mediates between um, the two. And we must always understand that what Plato and Aristotle in different ways are after is, uh, so it's saying, phenomena. is trying to save the phenomena. So here's a good question from Ben. Are the Adai logical moments that have an origin in the soul or are the Adai a part of the structure of things? How do we get beyond this Kantian division? I uh, careful, you um it says not a Kantian division, because because in Kant there's nothing in the soul. There's not there's not a soul back that contains anything. We're born with it. Um in Kant actually Kant solves for a few issues that come up in Plato and in Aristotle, which is the the free is is, is the freedom of the self grounding of thinking, um, that we'll discuss in detail at the course, uh, and the origin, let's say, uh, is so is also you know origin we should not conflate with with cause, uh, definitely not uh, in the sense of of, of a cause effect relationship that we have today of causality. Um, but the the origin is uh, is as it were is uh, is the moment in which, through drawing out from the phenomena, that which gives form to them, that's the origin. So they're never just purely given. Hmm? That's what we have to understand, uh, and hence moments, not things, not entities in some ghost-like metaphysical hinterland. Uh, that, that's the, the cartoon version that even Nietzsche, of course, knew is not really Plato. So, good question. Uh, Kant will be very important in our reading of Plato. And, yeah, uh, but it's, there are moments. Yeah? Okay. So, oh, oh, there he is again. Harris, as always, thank you very much for your uh, contribution. And Harris, I know, has enrolled. I've seen that. So I look forward to having you. A Greek amongst us. Okay, this is a great question. Why do we return to the cave other than merely helping others escape the cave? Well, no. He does return, remember, out of pity or compassion the one who has been freed. But he does not so perhaps so much to help them escape. But there is a necessity to rule through the shadows. We'll discuss the Eidolai, uh, the shadow images, which just phonetically is quite close to ideology. Um, and so... So, you know, what is good about the cave and the shadows themselves? These are great questions. I hope uh, that you enroll, Ben, Ezra, if you haven't yet. I don't know if you have. Maybe you have. Uh, but um, so 
is not so much about what is good, but let's let's just pretend that um, the cave remains, even though it actually does disappear uh, in the text, and we'll trace that disappearance. What is crucial about that myth is the in is the understanding that again, the forms are not just given. There is no moment of absolute and total and uh, perfect enlightenment for all. And also that there is no pure highest knowledge without doxa. And also that what is, properly is, has proper, ontolo proper ontological status of being, can lapse into a mere seeming. We have expressions of this when we say, he has become a mere shadow of himself, etc. Just to make this perhaps a bit more graspable. So, uh, what is can become illusory. What is an illusion can become something of being. And Plato is completely aware of this. Gigantum machia peritesusias. He speaks of this in the, one of the later dialogues, the so-called uh, sophistis, the sophist dialogue. The gigantic battle for being is precisely what we have come to call realism versus idealism. Now, Plato is already aware of this. Hmm? And one of the issues that the Universalien Streit, so the, 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 the uh, universal controversy period in the Middle, in Middle Ages had, which is realism versus nominalism, broadly speaking, do universals exist or not, is precisely the assumption that these are entities. And on, on both assume this, hmm? the universalists and the nominalists. And so there's a reification of the logical moment and unfolding of the Adi uh, in which we participate. Yeah, that's the issue. And Plato is aware that shadows are necessary. One cannot get rid of the shadows. Uh, and to give you an example, this is uh, an example by my friend Max Gottlich. And I've, I think I've given this before. If you're an actor, let's say you're an actor, an actress, you're on stage and you pretend for the play, or for the film to be in love. And over time, over the course of two or three months of pretending to be in love, you just might fall in love with another person. So the pretense could very much lead to something becoming, quote unquote, in a vernacular sense, real. Okay, good question. Thank you, Wendy. Very kind. Well, look, Nietzsche does not have contempt for Plato. Uh, maybe a little bit. Um, but, but with Nietzsche, you always have to read between the lines. It's an attack on Platonism, not Plato. Uh, and he does this. But, and he, he's also always he's attacking 19th century classicists who have, who revere Plato, but perhaps have utterly no idea um, so much about what Plato is genuinely on about. Not, not that maybe Nietzsche knew uh, all that much about that either, but um, well. So, great question by Tong Wu. How much will the course delve into the original ancient Greek language? Yes, uh, very much so. So we will be considering, so I'll be working off the uh, Schleiermacher uh, translation. So I have the Greek here, uh, uh, right here. And if you, maybe I'll show you this again. One second, sorry. Just, we go to the first lecture. I'll turn on the, turn up the volume. Make sure it's actually, Playing one second. So he walked down. Katiben. He walked down. He walked down. Katiben. Okay, sorry, this is not working. I don't know why. He walked. He walked down. He walked down. Okay. Katiben. For some reason. This is the first. One second. Damn you, technology. Katiben. So forgive my pronunciation, it's not perfect. Uh, 
But uh, as you can hear, the very first word of the very first lecture is a Greek word, and it's also the very first word of this book, Kataben, I walked down. So we will continuously consider katabases, uh, katabases uh, the walking down, and anab so the, the simultaneity of walking up and down. Anabases, katabases will be significant throughout, and we'll always consider, so as I said before, we'll try and retranslate, for example, di kaiusune, translated as justice. Justice might lead to, you know, trigger people into thinking thinking of social justice and distributive justice, etc. Uh, none of this is at stake in Plato. What's at stake is whether the one who is where you are is appropriate to your soul, and whether how you how your soul is also holding itself is appropriate to its parts and to its talents. Let's just put it like that. So. We'll continuously go to the original Greek. You don't have to know Greek. Um, and in my lecture notes, there will be the Greek words will be there. They'll be in a, in, in a Latin alphabet. So, you know, uh, you can actually read it if you can't read ancient Greek. Um, some of you might know ancient Greek better than me, and that would be great because then we could, you know, look over the original text. So we will spend significant time just trying to understand the original Greek uh, and finding new translations for it. And there might actually, things might emerge from our discussions at the seminar that, you know, we come up with our own translations for certain uh, words. Okay, reading the matrix back. Uh, yeah, exactly. So we shouldn't read anything back. That's one thing that we, we will really attempt to do is not to read anything back into Plato, but to read Plato as someone who is responding to the threat of the sophists, and the threat uh, and and the the, the the dissolvement of the of the phenomena in either a Heraclitian flux or a Parmenidean Iliatic uh, stasis. So, but we will of course refer to, for example, Kant and Hegel, and Heidegger. Um, so far as they responded to Plato, but we won't be importing something from them into Plato, which would be anachronistic. How difficult was it to learn ancient Greek? Well, it wasn't actually that difficult, to be honest. Um, if you're not all too lazy, you can actually... Let me find something for you that you can... So. Look, my pronunciation of this is um, not perfect. It's how I was taught, which is more or less um, a German way of pronouncing it. Um, but here I am. In this, click on this link. This is me singing in ancient Greek <laughs> when I was a bit younger than now. So let's see. Ben, yeah, that was, yes, Ben, that was a question on nominalism. That's true, exactly. Did Julius, Julius Ebola uh, believe in the vulgarized version of Platonism? Yes, exactly. Uh, so Ebola, um, who was, you know, always on about the, 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 the traditional world where there's this, um, you know, there is, are the eternal forms of tradition, etc., uh, and th that's a, a that you know really a vulgar uh, Nietzschean version of, uh, of of Platonism on top of it. So quite uh, quite astonishing that he, you know, it's one of those cases where you have someone who's read a lot but not understood much. Okay, I'm going over this here. Okay. Okay, so obviously I will only answer questions on this course and not just about anything, you know. Okay, so if you have more questions on the course, let me know now because I'm leaving in a couple of minutes. But, George, I might apply to this course. I love the Spengler course. Yes, so we're now finishing up uh, the Spengler course. We'll have the final session next week. And uh, George, I hope you present. I don't know if you have already submitted 
something you can still do that and present your thoughts. The link to enroll is this one. And I will show you now again everything on here. If you, as I said, if you have a question, ask now because I'm leaving in a few minutes. If you have time for the seminars, there will be 10 seminars in total. They begin on Saturday, 20th of January. We're meeting Saturday, 6 to 8 p.m. Yeah, UK time, that's 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So a Saturday gives you enough time. The readings will be quite short. You can listen to the lectures. They guide you. They're not too, some of them are quite long. Some of them are a bit shorter. They guide you through some of the most important aspects. They are, I'm trying not to import anything of my own, really. I'm trying just to think along with Plato. Commentare, to comment, to think with. That's what a comment should be, nothing else. And we're also, of course, trying to break something open, to open the text up to us uh, so that um, it's not just the trite old uh, Platonism that uh, you can just read up on Wikipedia. So, we will be discussing the myth of the cave, the analogy of the sun and the line, uh, the anacyclosis of the forms of government, the significance of beauty, the idea of the good, the vision of earth, the theory of the soul, the so-called theory of forms, what justice really means for Plato, uh, the so-called noble lie and the education and turning of the philosopher kings. You'll find all seminar dates on this enrollment page as well. Uh, if you Once you enroll, you have indefinite access to all the uh, course materials online. Uh, and you, if you don't have time to do the seminars, so let's say you can make less than five or six seminars. Self-study uh, is good for you. If you have time for the seminars, this should be it. You know, this is the one you'd like to enroll in. If you want to discuss Plato, etc., even uh, more with me, it's different. You can either choose five private tutorials with me or eight private tutorials with me and there's also a payment plan just to point this out so um yeah so this is it uh, i think on the technical side of things we meet over zoom um we meet for about two usually so it's two hours maybe we go over just a little bit um 10 weeks in a row beginning in the new year if you enroll now there's enough time to start reading the text uh, and get uh, prepared. All lectures have been uploaded. What ha I have not yet uploaded is the uh, lecture notes. Um, they will come, I will go over them again and improve on them, etc. So, and so you can download those as well at some point once they're up there. So, let's see. Um, well, so yeah, the, there's a good question. Uh, I and mean, this is something to be discussed at the seminars, really. Is the idea of Telos absent in Plato compared to Aristotle? Brief answer, uh, more or less, yes. That's one of the... And also, you, you'll see me slip into Aristotelian language sometimes, actualization uh, or, the pot, pot, or potentiality, actuality. Um, so, in, in, which... Because Aristotle does attempt again to get even closer to unique phenomena to particulars <laughs> well okay this this is uh, you know. well it's not it's not about contributions yeah because then then we're just looking for you know, these sort of you know how, how does this influence this and how, how does this what is it, that without plato there's nothing that that's a, if you wanted to know what 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 the greatest contribution is that is, there's no aristotle and so oh yeah i mean definitely if you read his uh, on the essence of um of truth yeah and what heidegger has to say about this you can it's also in my book um 
uh, that uh, with to no fault, not to Plato's fault, but how the the the, the, re the reception of Plato forgets the moments of concealment and unconcealment in the cave. So that we assume, again, as I said before, that there's a givenness of the idea of the good, a givenness of the sun. Um, Heidegger reminds us of that. <laughs> Neoplatonists come across as sophists to me, as in they are scholars of Plato, not real Platonists. They're not, yeah, they've got, um, so Neoplatonism is a bizarre uh, rarefication of Plato's thought. Uh, and yes, that's it. So Max, yeah, Max hasn't rolled, I know that, okay. Well, the, okay, where can I purchase your book? Uh, I, it's probably, it's not very cheap, unfortunately. Um, It's uh, published by Springer. So the title is Heidegger on Death and Being. I'll send you the Amazon UK. Uh, yeah, so. Okay, that's the link to the book. It's... Might, you, you might be able to get it through if you're a student somewhere just order it through your library uh, and yes so again thank you very much for listening we will Uh, no, bizarre is not good. Uh, it's not. It's not good to have uh, a Neoplatonist reification of Plato. Well, it is okay. It's good in the sense, if you want to be more, you know, moralized about this, it's good in the sense that it shows you what Plato is not on about. That's how it's good. So, um, yeah, Max, we'll we'll get to all of your questions. Max is already very uh, driven. So again, here's the link to enroll. I uh, read the Sophist dialogue as well. I'll see you there. We have, uh, I think about 20 places left in the seminars for now. I don't know how quickly people enroll. It, it always depends. Um, some will probably only decide next year which I hope is then not too late, but once it's full, it's full. So again, thank you very much, everyone, and good night.